Okay, well, welcome everybody to our October national call. And it's my pleasure today to start off the call that will, the main part of which will be presented by Heather Kalikowski from Cornell University School of Hotel Administration. And the title of our presentation tonight is Tempting Your Taste Buds, Using the Flavor Wheel to Focus on Taste. Uh, before Heather gets started, I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction. My name is Marianne Krasny, and I'm a member of the ECA Education Community committee and a faculty member at Cornell University. So why are we interested in talking about taste tonight? Actually, the tempting your taste buds is going to focus on plant rich diets. And probably all of you or most of you are familiar with Project Drawdown. And at least in scenario one, where they rank their 82 solutions, plant rich diets number three. I think in scenario two, it's number four. But in other words, it's always in the top five of ways that we can draw down our greenhouse gas emissions. So why is that? Uh, here's just a little graphic of the digestion system of a cow. So basically, we're when we talk about plant-rich diet, we're concerned about all forms of meat, but mostly ruminant meats. So that could be buffalo, but I don't think we need to worry about too many people eating a lot of buffalo here. But it's also beef, um, milk because it's from cows, and lamb and goat. So the problem is, is that these ruminants have this multi-chambered stomach, and when they break down their food, they release methane, which then goes right back, most of it, out of their mouth in the form of burps. There's also issues with manure, et cetera, but they actually produce a lot of methane emissions, which is very strong greenhouse gas. So you can see here in terms of CO2 emissions per kilogram of edible portion of different foods, beef is way up there. The other meats are a little bit, are quite a bit less. Of course, cheese is a little bit more, again, because it's mostly produced by these ruminants. And then you can see all the plant-rich foods are quite low in comparison. The rice is a little higher, and that's also has to do with methane because rice is often grown in very wet conditions in these rice patties. And so again, there's some anaerobic decomposition and produces methane. Okay, but the good news is, if you don't wanna just completely stop eating meat or dairy products, you don't have to be vegan to make a difference. You might choose, for example, a flexitarian diet. And you can see here that in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the vegan diet is obviously reducing the most. But the flexitarian diet is still doing a lot. And that's just limiting, you know, having quite limited meat and dairy. And you can go on down. And even if you choose to eat the healthy Mediterranean diet, moderate meat, but rich in vegetables, you're still making a difference in terms of reducing your greenhouse gases from what our normal American diet is. Okay, so don't read this. I don't intend you to read this slide, but I put it up here because I just wanted to talk about that even though tonight we're gonna to be focusing on you know, how we can prepare delicious plant-rich meals that tempt our taste buds, this is also a policy issue. So Francis Stewart from ECA and also Jerry Wiley from Climate Reality are working with three Cornell students, undergraduate seniors, and they are all compiling a list of different bills that have been proposed in the states and at the federal level that all relate to food, plant-rich diet and reducing meat emissions. And so far they've come up with 24 different bills. They'll be compiling this into a report by December. And so I'm hoping next year that those of us who are interested in plant-rich diet and the people who have expertise in policy might be able to use this report and these different initiatives to try to think about what policies might go into the Farm Bill or other climate legislation. Also last year, or last spring, I should say, last semester, we had a group of Cornell students who worked with some of our illustrious members of ECA, including our fearless, um, I forget your exact title, Jen, <laughs> executive manager or something like that. Anyway, Jen Chandler, Leslie, our fearless leader, Margot Frank from NorCal, Marilyn Price, Mark Cook, there may have been a few others, and they compiled uh, recipes for all these delicious plant-rich meals, 
And there's also little stories about Jen and Mark and Leslie and the rest of us. So um, you can find this on the ECA website. I think the sl it's slash every day. All right, so with that, I wanted to introduce Heather Kolakowski, who is a lecturer in food and beverage management at the Cornell University School of Hotel Administration. And Heather's also the associate director for the Cornell Institute for Healthy Futures. Heather teaches food and beverage courses, including restaurant management and nonprofit social enterprise and food justice. She also taught at New York's version of the CIA in the Hudson Valley, which is also the Culinary Institute of America, very famously. And she's a 2000 graduate of the Cornell School of Hotel Administration and a 2002 graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. So Heather served as food and beverage manager for the Four Seasons Hotel companies in Washington, DC and Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So just make sure you got the, that's the Four Seasons Hotel, not the landscaping company. And um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Heather. Thank you so much, Marianne, for that the introduction. And I'm really excited and grateful to have been asked to present to you this evening. Um, I was working with Marianne last fall on the student projects and I heard from Mark as he introduced um, Elders Climate Action. And I thought this is an amazing organization that's going to help uh, usher in some change that's greatly needed uh, today. So I'm very excited to present to you this evening. Um, so let me just share my screen so that you have my slides. Um, and I also encourage you in the chat, feel free to introduce yourselves to each other. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to um, have a little bit of a conversation. I'm just setting up my screen so that I can see that. So I'm going to talk tonight about embracing flavor. And I'm going to share with you an example of the flavor wheel. Um, and why is that important is because we want to think about ways to incorporate more plant rich foods in your diet, but also ways to explore opportunities to try new foods, which for many of us, um, we tend to get into a routine where we eat the same dishes over and over. Um, and it can be very intimidating to go to a bookstore and open up a cookbook or watch a TV show and see um, these uh, different dishes or ingredients that you may not be familiar with being used. Um, and also some of us, we don't want to, we don't want to waste the money to purchase something that we're not going to like ultimately. So at the end, I'm going to share some tips and pointers of, of ways that you can incorporate more plant rich foods in your diet, but also to share that exploration with your friends and family, especially, especially because we're heading into the uh, end of the year and the holiday season where there's um, some opportunities to get together safely, hopefully, you know, within, within our pandemic guidelines to um, share with each other. So I'm excited to be able to talk about that. And I'm going to share a couple of my um, books that I, that I rely on uh, when it comes to culinary techniques and practices. Uh, as Marianne mentioned, I am a graduate of the hotel school at Cornell. I also went to the Culinary Institute of America, um, but my passion now is food justice and advocacy. So seeing the slide about the farm bill, um, I'm going to definitely be following up with you, Marianne, because I think that's uh, very important to understand the complexities of those bills that are being passed um, and understanding how important it is to share your voice, which is definitely what the ECA encourages, promotes, and helps to educate to be able to share your voice about climate change. So I'm very happy. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, so first, I'd like to start off with a quick question for the group. Um, I want you to think about what is your favorite food. Of course, we're focusing on plant rich diets. So if, if you happen to say something that's meat-based, that's totally fine. Um, but I want you to think about what is your favorite food? Uh, maybe it's an ingredient, maybe it's a dish. Can you share it in the chat? 
um, with the rest of the audience um, and think about the food. Maybe it's a, a dish that you, oh, corn fritters, love corn fritters. Um, maybe it's a dish that you recall fondly from your childhood. Um, maybe it was the first dish you learned how to cook well. Um, maybe it's uh, something that reminds you of a, a good time in, in your life. Um, maybe it's something that you feel, feel healthy when you eat it. I love Tuscan soup. I love popovers. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad I, I had a snack before the presentation <laughs> because right now looking enchiladas, yes, tortillas. Oh, we've got lots going on in the, in the chat. I love it. So, so as you're sharing these special dishes, can you, can you think about the reason why? Try and, try and think about the reason why do you like these dishes? What is it about this particular dish or food that makes it your favorite. And that's where we're gonna to get to the heart of a little bit in our discussion, spoon bread. Oh, I'm getting distracted by the food again. Um, that's where we're gonna to get to the heart of in this discussion uh, for the next you know, half hour, 45 minutes. And if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the Q and A. That's definitely where we're gonna be pulling our questions from, um, but feel free to, to, to share with the, the others who are on the call in the chat. Um, because that's a great, great opportunity to get to know other, other people. But what about this food makes it your favorite? I love hollandaise sauce. I made hollandaise sauce when I worked um, in a kitchen every day for 64 days. So um, hollandaise is one of my favorite, favorite sauces to make. And we'll talk about sauces. Um, is it the taste? Is it the smell of the dish or the food? Um, there's something about fresh bread out of the oven to me that just, I could, I could, I could smell a loaf of bread for hours. The mouthfeel, um, now mouthfeel is kind of tricky because some people, um, they can be very sensitive to textures. Uh, you can be very sensitive to hot or cold. Um, and even something that uh, we'll talk about, if you've ever had Pop Rocks, the candy, um, or had a carbonated beverage that's really, really carbonated and you get this tingling sensation in your mouth, this mouthfeel can, can be pleasant. It also could be a little painful, but we're gonna talk about that as we explore the flavor wheel. But maybe there's a, a memory that's attached to that food that draws you into uh, fondly reminiscing. So keep these ideas in mind as we start to explore how to embrace flavor. Um, I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, and we are currently struggling with trying to taste different uh, fruits and vegetables and explore. Um, and it's truly, the, the research states that, that, that someone has to taste something 17 times before they can truly make a decision if they like it or not. Um, and, and that takes a commitment. But it's also interesting to think about what is flavor and how do we um, as humans perceive flavors. So I want to share with you two books that are, are absolutely, when I was in culinary school, um, I, I heard the author speak, but I'm showing you mine, The Flavor Bible um, by Karen Page and Andrew Dornenberg. And then more recently, um, I think in 2014 or 2015, Karen Page wrote The Vegetarian Flavor Bible. And truly, you can get it on Kindle for your, for your phone. Um, you can purchase it in, in hardback. It is a wonderful book of exploration of what we're just about to talk about, these different flavors um, and how you can use them to expand your palate and try more plant-focused dishes, but also to expand and, and try a way to um, lessen your impact on the climate. So that's something that's really important. One of the bases of, and, and Karen Page and Andrew Dornenberg, they've written several books, many books, um, from the culinary perspective, which is why I'm drawn to it. And uh, they also talk about food and wine pairing. So if you also, with your favorite dishes, do like wine, you should check out some of their other, other books as well. Um, but this idea of what is flavor, and they've, they've identified these key components that make up our definition of flavor. It's taste. So this is what we perceive in our taste buds. Um, it's mouthfeel, which some of you are talking about in, your, um, in the chat. Uh, what we perceive from the rest of the mouth. Aroma, this is something that's really, really critical. And this is something that has been very um, challenging in the hospitality industry because 
when someone has COVID and it affects their, um, their taste and their smell, it can seriously impact how they respond. I have, a, I have a friend who's a sommelier and when he was unable to smell the wines, it really, it really impacted how he could handle his job, but also how his appreciation of wine um, changed. Uh, so this idea of aroma is critical. It's really important when it comes to eating and enjoying foods. Um, that's why when you have a cold and you try to eat something, it just doesn't taste the same um, because you're not able to smell it. And the olfactory senses is really, really important um, when it builds into flavor. And then the last aspect of this composition of what is flavor is the X factor. And this is the, you know, what we perceive with our other senses, plus our heart, our mind, and our spirit. Um, and I just love that because for me, food is such a visceral thing. Obviously, we need it to survive. But as a, as a culinarian, as someone who studies food, um, the, the social aspect of food is so important. And that's something that I think is something we should definitely uh, remember um, when we're exploring uh, different tastes and feel of foods. So the five basic tastes, you may think, wait, there's only four. There's actually a, a recent um, addition to the five basic tastes, but you know of sweet, right? The, the sugary sensation, um, salty, sour, bitter. And the last one, which is a more recent taste that they've identified is called umami. And, and you can say it out loud, umami. I just love that word. It just reminds me of this, this sensation of something. It feels meaty, like a mushroom or um, like savory, just be, beyond. It's, it's like a combination of the other tastes, but it's a little bit more. And that's the umami. And that's something that you see um, when you uh, taste mushrooms, MSG, which is monosodium glutamate, is not really the best uh, 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 flavor enhancer, but you'll see it sometimes. It gives that sensation of, of meatiness. And that's, that's something to consider because when you're trying new dishes, when you're creating a new recipe or trying a new recipe, understanding this kind of basic taste that you're going to be experiencing is important. Some of us prefer sweet things. Some of us actually would rather have something salty um, as opposed to sweet. And when you, when you tie it back to cravings of what you want to eat, what you are, are, are just really want to have, um, it usually hits into these different tastes. So it's something to consider when we're thinking about um, expanding our palates. Now, mouthfeel um, can be broken down into these four components. And I'm highlighting a lot of what um, Karen Page, the author of the Vegetarian Flavor Bible, has goes into. And I highly encourage you um, to check it out because she has a chapter that actually goes through the a timeline of the emergence of the preference of plant-based foods and plant-based diets um, through the course of specifically uh, highlighting in the United States, but she does talk about um, other countries. And she researched and she studied and she interviewed chefs all across the country, really famous chefs, Michelin star chefs, um, chefs that are focused on a plant-based diet, like maybe Amanda Cohen of Dirt Candy, um, and, and gets, it was getting their feedback as she was creating this book. And this idea of um, understanding the complexities of mouthfeel can help you again as you're trying to explore different dishes and expand your palate. So temperature definitely affects uh, the perception of taste. If something's cold, it, it actually suppresses the sweetness um, on, uh, uh, on your taste buds. So utilizing hot and cold um, is, is also something to consider when you're preparing a dish. Um, texture, texture is something that's really important to consider, particularly if you are an individual who's trying to shift to a uh, maybe a flexitarian or a plant-based diet, because oftentimes what, what we, we might crave is that sensation of meat if we were a meat eater. And a lot of what meat um, entails, the, the preferences for meat is, is texture. And this idea of like crispiness of, of um, uh, fried chicken or crunchiness of, of uh, chips or, um, a garnish to like, a, I think of a, like a tortilla soup and you put tortilla chips on the top so it crunches. 
Um, and this idea of you know, chewy chicken um, or crispy bacon, a lot of times you'll see trying to take plant-based items to give you that sensation of that mouthfeel, it makes, the, the, makes you feel like you're not missing so much that meat because the meat really is based off of a lot of the texture that you're gonna, you're gonna have. And the idea of creamy, that's another thing. When you're switching to a, a, a plant-based diet, many people are like, well, I mean, I like, I like milk, I like cream, and I, you know, I like that sensation on the, the palate. There are alternatives, you know, there's plant-based milks, there's cashew cream that can give you the similar mouthfeel of that coating in your mouth. Um, that gives you uh, that sensation if you're interested in, in trying to have a creamy texture. Um, it can be replicated or, it, you know, it's, it's just a, another way of adding that texture uh, to, to your mouth. Um, having this uh, uh, piquancy, the, the idea of the sharpness or spiciness, I think of um, wasabi or horseradish, right? Sometimes if you have horseradish or wasabi, it's almost painful how, how, how sharp it can be, but to a, a pleasant degree. So utilizing that from a mouthfeel standpoint is important. And the last consideration is astringency. So if you've ever had um, a really strong cup of tea and you feel that drying sensation on the sides of your tongue, um, or maybe a red wine and you get that, that drying sensation, that's astringency. And they're, they're plants um, that can give you a similar feel in the mouth. So like walnuts, uh, cranberries and unripe persimmons give you that feeling of astringency. So if you think about like the complexity of tastes and the complexity of mouthfeel, there is so much to explore. Um, but you have to, to try with intention. Um, and we very much in our day-to-day -day lives that are very busy, um, we often will do what, what I call distracted eating. You might be on your phone, you might be watching TV, you might be watching reading a newspaper, you might be talking to someone and you don't actually think about the food that you're eating. Um, I invite you to the next time you try something, the next time you, you eat something, even if it's the regular snack you have every day, stop and think. And, and, and think about, okay, how does this feel on my tongue? How does this feel in my mouth? And is there a lingering aftertaste? And if you concentrate on the food that you're tasting, you'll learn a little bit more about those ingredients and you'll, you'll start to realize, hmm, do I really like this? Or am I just eating it because I'm supposed to have turkey at Thanksgiving? Um, or do I wanna try something different? And if you consciously focus on trying it, and, and comparing it, and we'll use the flavor wheel to do that, um, it's, it opens up a really amazing opportunity to, to actually relearn and learn about these foods. Just like a child, if you've never tasted it before, it can be really exciting. And you might find your favorite vegetable or your favorite fruit that in the past you used to say, oh, I, don't, I don't like that. Um, I would never eat that, but uh, I invite you to try it. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the idea of how does um, your nose enhance the perception of what you're eating. And, and it, the aroma is thought to be responsible for about 80% or more of people's perception of flavor. Um, hence the reason when uh, my, my children have to take medicine, cold medicine, I tell them to hold their nose so that they don't taste the cough medicine. Um, because if you, if you stop that olfactory response, it it's, uh, decreases the flavor perception in your mouth. So we know of sweet, right? That's a very common um, uh, consideration of, of aroma, something that smells like, you know, sugar or honey or, you know, some fruits and vegetables uh, can be considered sweet. The savory, that's the, um, it's like the meatiness, the cheesiness, uh, like nutritional yeast. If you've ever sprinkled you nutritional yeast on something, it gives you that kind of um, enhanced flavor, I think you would say, but it, it really does come from this, the smelling it as you're, as you're tasting it. Some things that are smoky can be savory um, and you can get that from cooking techniques uh, and then even um, spiciness. And the really interesting thing about exploring a plant-rich diet is 
there are many cultures that meat is not the primary focus of the plate. And um, understanding, you know, the idea and, and use of components of spices um, and companion ingredients to enhance flavors will really, really um, help you to explore these different types of dishes and maybe even expand what you're, what you're doing in your day-to-day -day, um, um, diet. So chemisthesis, that's that tingling sensation I was talking about of carbonation, right? Um, it's something that also maybe the, 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 it plays tricks on you. If you've ever had um, spearmint and your mouth suddenly feels cold, um, that's that sensation. And then pungency, um, this is something that potentially could be really, really, um, you know, tickling on the nose or it's that sharp sensation like horseradish or wasabi. Um, so that's something to, to consider from, from aroma. And then the last component of what is flavor is that X factor, right? Um, thinking about the emotional, uh, you might have a preference for your mother's cornbread. So if someone's had corn fritters um, and said that they go home and their mom makes the corn fritters and it just reminds them. You may try corn fritters from the most famous chef um, but they don't quite taste the same. Or sometimes I try and redo a dish that my mom would, would make for me growing up. It just doesn't quite taste the same. I follow the recipe. I have a culinary degree and it's not quite the same. So this idea of that emotional connection is really, really important. Um, the mental connection as well, as I, as I said, the intention of, of understanding it, but also you'll see this in, in, in some restaurants where they, they really try and think about the presentation and then maybe they elevate the dish so it's really tall and, and you have to kind of deconstruct it and think about it. so you really have to focus on what is this what's going on and and it gives you a a, a focus to the meal um, that can enhance your perception of the flavor and then the last one is is spiritual and as i said before food truly is something that can connect people um, and elevates discussion, elevates um, feelings as you, as you partake in the meal, particularly partaking in the meal together. So all of these components come together to create this idea of flavor. So the flavor wheel is a tool that you can use to be able to describe this better. Um, and if you've ever gone to maybe a, a wine tasting or you've seen a wine tasting in a movie, um, and you see the person smelling and they start listing off all of the things they smell. Um, and if you were in the wine tasting, you might smell and go, oh, I, I smell grapes, maybe even red grapes. Like it, it's the, the, the thing about the flavor wheel, it helps to give you the words to articulate what are you tasting. I encourage you right now to think about this. How would you describe oranges? The flavor of an orange. Immediately in my mind, I think of the color, right? But how do you, how do you, does a, does a color have a flavor? It's really hard to describe. So the more you taste, the more you talk about things, um, the larger vocabulary you're going to have, but also the larger memory, they call it um, a mouth memory where you can remember the flavors you've tasted in the past to be able to use it to describe um, what you're tasting in front of you. So this is the flavor wheel. Um, this is actually from the Escoffier uh, um, Academy. And uh, I'll make sure that I share my slides with Jen as well as the link to this document. Um, and you'll see how they've broken it down and they use this for their culinary training um, of this idea of the tastes, right? Those five basic tastes, the savory, sour, sweet, salty, bitter, um, the umami is in that savory category. And then the aroma, how the taste and the smell combines together to give you those sensations. And then the last is the mouthfeel. So these three components, and I'll even throw in the, you know, that X factor we talked about, but these three components, if you're thinking strictly on um, trying to use the flavor wheel to be able to be um, objective about explaining what something tastes like versus subjective. Subjective, you definitely are getting into that spiritual and mental and emotional connection. 
But when you're when you're truly trying to understand what are you what are you eating, um, taking the moment to think about how does this taste? Um, is it sweet? Is it a mellow, delicate sweet? Is it a sharp, zesty sweet? Um, do I do I get some spicy notes? Is it warming or is it you know um, jarring a little bit pungent in in my mouth and in my nose? Um, and then the idea of moisture and texture and consistency of, of how it feels on the tongue, how it feels coating your mouth. Um, these are all ways to think about what you're tasting. Um, are there any, I mean, I haven't necessarily seen the chat, but if, if, if there's any questions in the Q&A that I can answer at the moment, or I can talk about some tips and ways to boost flavor. Um, I think the questions aren't, they're, they're more general, not quite related to your specific topic. They're in the Q&A, yep. not the chat. So you might want to wait till the end. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. I see the questions. Those are, those are good. Those are very good questions. We'll get to them. I mean, uh, when we talk about flavor and ways to enhance flavor, so um, the sensation of losing, I'll just answer this one in particular. How can we recover our flavorful life when COVID has banished our smell? Um, it's... Oftentimes there's a, a technical term and, I, and I've forgotten the name of it of when you lose your sense of smell and taste, but there's actually resources out there and they've definitely become stronger now that more people are impacted by this, um, this lack of smell and taste of, of how to almost retrain yourself um, in, in eating and smelling and tasting things again. Um, but the lingering effect, sometimes it's not that you don't smell it, it's that it smells completely different than what it was. Oftentimes I've seen research where um, individuals who were suffering from COVID, uh, all they could smell was petroleum or gas or even smoke. Um, and you can imagine how that can change your, your, your um, desire to eat anything if all you smell is smoke. So there are steps to try and retrain um, yourself, but the hope is that it goes away with time. Um, but it's definitely being researched now of, of bringing that, that back. So I wanted to kind of shift a little bit now that we talked about um, what is flavor and using the flavor wheel, um, how can we boost flavors uh, when we are thinking particularly of a plant-rich diet? And I love this picture because one of the vegetables I do not prefer is cauliflower. But I think one of the reasons why I do not prefer cauliflower is because growing up, um, when we had cauliflower, it was just the uh, frozen cauliflower boiled in water. So it was very bland. Um, it was almost a little overcooked and mushy. So now when I see and, they see and think of cauliflower, I immediately am like, oh, I don't necessarily wanna do that. But if you utilize, and you can see the picture, they've got pomegranate seeds, they've got nuts, uh, they've got um, cilantro and spices, probably blackening spices and chickpeas in this salad. You've got lots of different textures, you've got flavors, the cauliflower itself is roasted, so you have those roasty notes. Um, honestly, this dish is a, is a fabulous uh, autumn into winter dish to be able to, to, to test um, and eat and then also ways to boost the flavor of the ways to enhance it. So there's, there's two kind of components that I wanna think, wanna share with you when we talk about boosting flavor. And um, in particular, if you are trying to uh, try a new vegetable or try a new fruit or try something different um, that is plant focused, uh, thinking about ways to um, boost the flavor of those ingredients um, after you've done kind of the analysis and testing and, and, and understanding the, uh, the senses as you, as you try it. Um, culinary techniques. So grilling is a great way to add that smokiness um, and that mouthfeel of the crunchy, the crispiness. Um, pan searing, which is when you, when you take the ingredient in a um, a frying pan with just a little bit of oil at a high heat temperature. Again, you're going to get this sometimes a caramelization um, or the Maillard reaction on the outside of the ingredient to make it uh, uh, a little bit sweet and kind of toasty nutty notes. 
um, marinating things. Uh, in particular, I mean, tofu itself is a fairly neutral ingredient. And oftentimes tofu takes on the flavor profiles of what you put with it. Um, that's one of the really cool things about tofu and that how versatile it can be. The other thing about tofu is the mouthfeel. Because if you, if you cook um, tofu and you crumble it, it actually gives a very similar mouthfeel to uh, ground beef. So if you're looking for like a filling for tacos and you're used to using ground beef, uh, if you try tofu um, and you add the uh, taco seasoning ingredients to it, um, it's often uh, you might not even be able to taste the difference, especially if you're putting, you know, the cilantro and the salsa um, and the lettuce on top, or maybe the corn relish. You know, you're getting a lot of different um, flavors into it, and it's more of the texture that will remind you of ground beef. So I encourage you to try that. Adding a sauce is definitely a way to boost flavor, and there's lots of um, there's lots of recipes out there of how to create um, plant-based sauces or vegan sauces. Uh, and this idea of that creamy mouthfeel, right? Use cashew, um, you can use almond milk to still get that, that sensation on the tongue. But adding a sauce um, often will enhance uh, the flavor. It adds moisture for sure. So if you grilled something and it's a little overdone, adding a sauce can help revive it. Um, and then a reduction. So re reducing a liquid by simmering or boiling, right? What it does is it intensifies the flavor of that liquid. We do this in culinary uh, school. We do this in, in kitchens. Um, if you take a vegetable stock that has lots of different vegetables in it and you cook it and you simmer it and you reduce it down, the vegetable flavor gets stronger because there's less water to the ingredients um, and it just gets stronger. So oftentimes it's a great way to create a sauce or a base or to enhance a soup or um, um, like a stock or something that goes, uh, that you're braising uh, the vegetables in and it can really enhance and, and amplify the notes of the dishes. In fact, the idea of potentially getting a, um, a vegetable stock of the vegetable that you're preparing um, and reducing it down. It's just like a, a double boost of flavor where um, it's really kind of interesting to see. The other thing that might help is spices, obviously. Now we don't put spices on just to put spices on. Um, although my kids, you put ketchup on just to put ketchup on. But this idea of spices can enhance uh, the ingredients as well. Salt is a classic example where you put a little bit of salt on something and it makes it taste not necessarily like salt, it may, makes it taste more like the ingredients. Um, now, if you put too much salt, yes, it's going to start tasting like salt. Um, the idea of also keeping in mind that many of us, when we're looking at a plant-based diet, we might be doing it for climate change and, and the impact on climate change, but we also might be looking at a plant-based diet based on our, um, Med, uh, medical reasons why we want to be healthier. And you do need to be very careful about your sodium intake. So if you use the, the spice blends, the pre-made spice blends, just be really careful at looking at it because sometimes there is a lot of salt in those um, and it, it, it can counter affect maybe one of the reasons why you're trying to go uh, eat the plant-rich diet from that perspective. Uh, fresh ground spices are better than pre-ground spices, but not everyone has the ability to get whole ingredients and then use a spice grinder and use it. But one thing I do encourage you to try is fresh ground pepper. Um, fresh ground pepper is, is very different than the, the, the pepper shaker that you get. Um, that's who knows how long ago they actually uh, ground the spice. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit different. It's also kind of fun going back to that X factor if you've ever seen the nice pepper grinder at a, at a restaurant, you sit down and say, would you want pepper? And they, they grind the pepper onto the dish in front of you. It's kind of nice to do that, that additional, like at the very end, add that little touch of, of the, the, the heat and the spiciness of the pepper itself. And you can also see different spices. And someone mentioned it uh, uh, in the chat about um, Indian food having a lot of different vegetable dishes and primarily 
veg vegetables are the focus of a lot of the Indian foods, but also the spice blends and the, the spices that they use. Really interesting opportunity to try and explore. Um, you might find out, hey, I really don't like that particular spice blend. I, I don't like um, marjoram as an herb. Uh, and if I taste anything that has marjoram, I can, I can sense it almost immediately. Um, it tastes like soap to me. So this idea of something that uh, if you don't like it, try not to use that spice. But if you might find something that's new, um, try it in your cabinet that, that can bring out a different flavor within the, the vegetables. So as we heading into fall or we're in fall, we're, you know, we're heading into fall, we're heading into winter. Um, and you potentially are going to be gathering your, with your families to celebrate. I want to highlight the idea of using seasonal ingredients. We just came off of the summer um, and having, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. I, I think, Jen, you were mentioning you were part of the CSA and getting the box and being like, oh, what's, what's fresh right now? I mean, the CSA is wonderful um, because, you know, this just came out of the garden. This just came out of the field and vegetables and fruits that are picked um, taste best right when they've been harvested. Uh, although we do have the capability and, and, and living in Ithaca, New York, um, I, I, if I wanted to eat fresh fruit, food in the winter time, I'd be very hard pressed to find it. So we do rely on like roots and vegetables um, that we can store over the winter. But the idea of eating seasonally, you're gonna be eating the vegetable at its peak, at its prime. Um, and it tastes different. Strawberries straight off the bush uh, with a little, a little bit of warmth because they've just been harvested. They taste different than the Driscoll strawberries that are in the grocery store that came shipped from California. Uh, well, but if you're in California, they're fresher than, than if they're here in New York. So understanding seasonality is important. And there's lots of different charts on the internet. There's lots of different books that talk about seasonal produce. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. You can definitely research that. And there's a lot of different um, grocery store chains that really focus on seasonal ingredients now. This particular dish, uh, this picture that I found just highlights to me, this screams to me Thanksgiving because it's, um, you've got carrots, you've got yellow carrots, you've got uh, the onions. I think there's a little bit of leek in there, um, but you see how it's been roasted in the oven. So you got that, you have that car caramelization um, on the outside of the vegetable. So it adds sweetness and tanginess, um, but also the, the, the toasty roastiness, almost like a meat. And it's just that dish in and of itself um, could be the focus of the meal. But we, in traditionally here in the United States, if you are a meat eater, right, an omnivore, we typically think of the meat as the focus of the meal. And then all of the side dishes, every cook, you know, any cookbook, it's like, oh, all the vegetable dishes are in the side dishes. You need to flip that narrative, switch it around, make those side dishes the main dish and try the meat as the, the accompaniment. And that is something that if you, if you consciously make your meal that way, um, people will try the vegetarian option or the, the plant-based option first, uh, and they might like it. Right? Oftentimes you're trying the side dish after you filled up with the meat. Um, so these are kind of techniques to be able to think about ways to expand um, your repertoire. So I wanna talk really briefly about autumn and winter and um, some culinary techniques that enhance those uh, seasonal ingredients and then talk about a couple of the seasonal ingredients that really are at its peak during this time period. So in the autumn, it's getting cooler in most places. Um, the, the leaves will change if you're living in a climate that has, has the leaves or those, those trees. Um, the nights are getting longer. Um, so you have the opportunity to change how you prepare things. In the middle of the summer, you're not really gonna be braising. You're not really gonna be roasting. It's just too hot. But in the autumn, you have the opportunity to switch to these culinary techniques that really enhance the flavors of the seasonal ingredients during that time period. So culinary techniques to use in the autumn, baking, braising, glazing, and roasting brings out those caramel, caramel, you know, those, those toasty notes in the dishes, which is just really, really fun. And um, you'll see we've got some of the, the, the key things that uh, 
that remind me of all of them, apples, bell peppers. And if you, if you get um, the vegetarian flavor Bible, she actually breaks it down and it's really fascinating. But thinking about what's in season during this time. So glazing is, so I used to make a dish called glazed carrots where I would um, blanch the carrots so they're still crunchy. And then I would toss them in a pan um, with butter. And uh, so as you are heating up the butter and you're tossing the carrots in the pan, the carrots get covered in that butter mixture. <laughs> um, but you could also use a, a, a reduced veg stock, right? So if you have a carrot, say if you have a carrot stock, it's basically covering the carrot with carrots and it enhances it. So that's glazing. Um, oftentimes we think of it when you're roasting something and you're adding um, moisture on top of it and it bakes on, sometimes it creates something crusty. Uh, it's a really interesting technique to try. Um, I encourage you to, to, to try it when. Um, mushrooms, particularly porcini mushrooms are, are available during the autumn season. But you also think of pumpkins, um, pomegranates, uh, quince, squash, the squashes are, are wonderful. The butternut squash right now is just amazing in many places. So if you think about that, but then, then you're, you're heading into the winter where it gets colder um, and you might want to focus on some different ingredients that's available. Um, again, the baking, the braising, the great glazing and the roasting, but now utilizing simmering where you're preparing the the, the vegetables in a broth and you're cooking them that way um, and slow cooking. And slow cooking is great because, you know, you put it in the morning in the slow cooker and when you come home from work, it's already a nice stew. Um, I would think of a, a bean chili uh, is amazing in the slow cooker. Um, but thinking about uh, the root veg that can be stored over the winter uh, as well as citrus. Now citrus, we don't grow citrus here in New York, but we do get it um, sent up from Florida uh, during this time period, but it's often something that we think of. So creating like a, a, an orange glaze or an orange marmalade, something to be able to add as a sauce or an accompaniment to, to the dishes. So the last thing that I wanted to say before we open up to more questions um, is the idea of what, what kind of tips and tricks can you use to increase um, plants-based uh, dishes in your diet itself. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to consciously uh, go to the grocery store and try something new that you've never tasted before. Um, I hate to waste food. You know, I hate to buy something and it's sitting in my fridge and it goes bad because I didn't plan or something happens and we just don't eat it. Um, so it is a commitment. But if you're thinking along the lines of, I want to try something new, there are some ways to maybe make it an event as opposed to um, a, a uh, kind of an everyday thing to try it. And if you're thinking about that flavor wheel um, and, you, and you're creating a new dish, consciously when you're tasting it, to do that analysis of, okay, what, what is, what am I, what's the sensation of the taste? Is it sweet? Is it sour? Is it bitter? Do I have that umami? Um, and kind of going through that process of identifying the different components of flavor and even acknowledging them out loud, like, oh, wow, this really tastes like popcorn or it tastes like um, caramel. Uh, it gives you a moment to pause and think about the dish. Now you may decide, hmm, I'm not a really big fan of this one. Um, we'll check it off and we'll try something else. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice to think of, okay, if you're having a holiday meal, try a new dish. Um, check out a new recipe. Encourage other people to bring plant-rich dishes to a potluck. Um, again, flipping that narrative of, or, or flipping that focus of instead of saying the main is going to be the meat, let's make the main one of the dishes. Another thing is, is depending on how you celebrate and get together with friends or family, maybe you can have a little chop competition and share and say, we're going to do a potluck. Um, the secret ingredients going to be yams. Bring your best yam dish and do a little taste testing and see who had the best yam dish um, and focusing on it being plant-based. Um, and then one other thing, last thing, to consider growing your own vegetables if you have the space um, to possibly try an experiment. Uh, and it's something that I've been using uh, with my kids is to try and get them to 
taste more fruits and vegetables is if we grow it, they're more interested in harvesting it and trying it because they contributed to making it. So here's, a, here's an example of what I did this year. Um, my husband uh, works at a grocery store. So I asked him to bring pickle buckets home. So we took five gallon pickle buckets and drilled holes in the bottom and put um, soil in there. And I got tomato plants. There's peppers in the front. Um, I had basil, I had squash, the squash in the back and zucchini, um, and I grew carrots. So you can see this is my last harvest because um, some of the tomatoes are green, but it's starting to get cold now. So I'm hoping that they're going to ripen. Um, I'm going to buy some bananas and put them in a bag and try and ripen them. But the idea of my kids were so excited to pull those carrots out of the ground and we washed them off and we ate them outside. And they thought it was great. One, they ran around, they thought they were bunnies, but it, they were so excited to try it um, and try something new. We tried tomatoes. I didn't, we didn't go for the spicy peppers, but you know, we tried tomatoes together. They were just so excited. So, so you don't need a lot of space to be able to grow a tomato plant. Um, and, and it makes it a little different. Of course, you're gonna have to plan for that next year if, uh, if you're in the Northern climate here. My last two slides of my favorite things, I wanted to share a couple of books. So again, the Flavor Bible and the Vegetarian Flavor Bible are great resources to start your journey into more plant-rich based foods. Um, but there's also a book by uh, Chef Catherine Pollins, who I worked with at the Culinary Institute of America when I taught there. She taught a class on um, plant-based foods for the students and also created this book about uh, cooking for special diets. And in it, um, and primarily thinking about, you know, using food as health. Um, and one of the dishes that I just absolutely love that's vegan actually is a grilled polenta with mushroom ragu. Um, and you don't even, it's a main dish and you don't even realize that there's no meat in it. It just tastes so rich and so amazing. So I'll also include this in the information I sent to Jen of these different books. Another one is Vegan Cooking for Carnivores by Roberta Martin. Um, it's kind of like a staple of, of thinking about ways to uh, change your, your pantry items to be able to support uh, new dishes. Um, in particular, he has a wild mushroom tomato sauce, which is amazing to go on pasta, uh, as well as a blackening spice. And I was thinking particularly that cauliflower, um, as well as a pumpkin pie that's vegan, kind of interesting. Um, so that's all that I have for my PowerPoint presentation. And I want to open up some, some questions and if there's anything I can answer. I think I went a little long, Jen. I got, got excited with the comments. So <laughs> let me stop sharing. Thank you so much, Heather. That was great. That was so much fun. I was nodding the whole way and well, I was getting pretty hungry too. But um, so we have a couple questions. I'll just launch right into them. So one is, and you can see them in the Q&A, is it easy to get all the protein and vitamins and other things you need for health if you only eat plants? Absolutely. Um, you do want to think there, there are, um, you know, in some instances, people say that there's certain vitamins that you don't necessarily get um, in some vegetables and fruits that you would get in, in meats. Um, but you can definitely receive the, the protein and, and the vitamins that you need. The most important thing is, is, is having a, a diversity of different fruits and vegetables. If you, if you only eat one, you're not going to get um, all of the nutrients that you need. Uh, so having a variety is important. Um, but I think one of the things that's a challenge in the United States in particular is, you know, the government, the government has um, guidelines that they, they tell people of what they should and shouldn't eat. And, and um, dairy is actually one of the things that they say, you know, you should have a certain amount of servings of dairy a day. And in reality, um, I think 70% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. Um, so this idea of making us consume dairy when in reality, our body doesn't digest it the way that it um, is needed, uh, the focus becomes a little different. That, that's a whole different political conversation, but um, the idea of 
focusing on a variety of plants and vegetables, you can get what you need um, to, to be healthy, to survive. Thank you. So we'll go to, we, we're going to just go over to the next question. So um, uh, we have another question about the, uh, their oven is, you know, big, they don't want to turn it on just to cook a small meal potentially. So um, what about cooking on stovetop or do you have any resources? Maybe that would be helpful since we don't have a lot of time, but. Yep. Yep. So you can get uh, the similar uh, um, Maillard reaction or the caramelization if you saute something in a pan that you potentially would get roasting in the oven. Um, and oftentimes, you know, uh, roasting in the oven, um, you know, we think of like a big pot roast or a big pork loin that needs all this space. But if you're, if you're preparing vegetables and, and cutting them up, um, you can actually, I, I have a, a, a small convection cooker. It's like a toaster oven <laughs> that you could, you could put your, um, your little tray of vegetables in the toaster oven and toast it up and it gets a similar browning as if you were to bake it. Um, so you can do some of those little tricks uh, and a slow cooker, it's true, a slow cooker, you're not necessarily gonna get as much of that caramelization because they often don't get hot enough. In an Instapot, you can um, because that tends to get a higher temperature where, where sometimes you do get a little browning if you use the Instapot um, and you brown it before you have it cooked for a longer period of time. Um, now there are, you could add like liquid smoke or other spices that make the sensation of something that's been roasted. Um, it just kind of depends. Uh, so the idea of, you know, um, if you can grilling outside, um, that's something to, to consider as well because you can get a similar um, um, charring and, and sensation from that standpoint. Thank you. Um, I just wanna ask one quick question um, that came from Mark. And, and that was, what do you, do you have any take on the, you know, Impossible Burger, the alt meats um, in terms of health or taste or texture or whatever? Um, so the, the Impossible Meats that are coming out, uh, I, I feel like they're definitely trying to um, attract individuals that want to eat meat to try plant-based mm -hmm. options. They are not necessarily healthier mm -hmm. than meat. Um, because they're, they, they might, in, in, it's, a, it's a processed food. So in the processing to create this impossible meat, they might be adding things to it that um, are high in calorie counts and are high in sodium in particular. Um, so I wouldn't say necessarily that it's, it's healthier than meat, um, but what, they're, what, they're, what I feel that they're trying to capture is the, the, the carnivores, the omnivores, right? that still want the sensation of meat, um, but are trying to branch out into plant-based um, cuisines. Uh, it's interesting to try. Um, they're often very expensive. So if you do have a limited um, budget for your food, uh, trying these kind of new um, items, uh, it it's might be cost prohibitive, um, but thinking alternatively, I mean, you can create, you could take the cauliflower and slice it thick and actually grill it or saute it, it almost tastes like a steak or a burger, you know, particularly if you've got certain seasoning spices on it. Um, so it, it's interesting and there's definitely expansion um, out there, but it isn't necessarily healthier. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate Heather and we had a few more questions, but we don't, it's already eight o'clock. So I'm just going to really, you know, offer my thanks to that really interesting, engaging and tasty presentation. And then I do have a few announcements before we go. One is that um, Tuesday, November, um, ah, I don't have, is it November 9th, Jen? Yes, November 9th. Right. Tuesday, November 9th. Um, there will be a presentation from Paul Hawkins from Drawdown about his new book, which is about regeneration and other things, other approaches to tackling climate. It's at 9 a.m. Pacific time and noon uh, EST. And uh, Jen will be sending out, well, it looks like you already posted the registration here. Um, so thank you, Jen. And then in December, we will be having a movie night. We're going to be showing 2040, which is a climate film. 
um, but a rather upbeat film. I haven't personally seen it, but I've heard great things about it. And that will be, as I mentioned, on the 13th, six o'clock to eight o'clock. The movie's about an hour and a half, and then we'll have a short discussion afterwards. And that will kind of be our Christmas giving celebration. So thank you so much, um, Heather, and to everybody who participated. And we'll look forward to continuing discussions, Heather. Thank you so much. I appreciate being asked to, to join tonight.